Friends, welcome to my channel. Before listening to this story, I will ask you to like and subscribe. It's not difficult for you, but it's nice for me. And we're starting. Colin Aldrich could not have foreseen this in any way. Everything in his life seemed to be going very well. Six months ago, he received a promotion at work and a decent salary increase. Celia's interior design business was gaining momentum, and now she was making a significant contribution to their family's income. The house they bought two years ago wasn't exactly luxurious, but it was big enough for their needs, and it was in a good neighborhood. Recently, he and Celia started talking about having children. Therefore, he did not expect trouble when it hit him. Colin couldn't help but notice an unfamiliar car parked in front of his house, but her presence didn't bother him. However, he became worried when after putting the car in the garage and entering the house, he saw Celia sitting in the living room next to a strange man. When he entered the room, she immediately stood up, and Colin couldn't help but notice how slim and attractive she looked. It was only when he focused on her face that he realized how nervous she was. Hi, honey. She greeted him. Then she pointed at the man still sitting on the couch. Do you remember Vince Callahan? What is it? She asked. He is my client. I was doing repairs in his office. You've met before? Ah, yes, I remember now. Hi, Vince. It's nice to see you again. What brings you to us? Vince gave Celia an embarrassed look and she cleared her throat. Damn it, it's not easy at all, she said softly. Then she took a deep breath as if preparing for the upcoming ordeal and added, Darling, I have no other choice. I'm leaving you. These words made no sense to him. What did you say? She shook her head sadly. I know it's shocking, but I filed for divorce. He stumbled to the chair opposite the sofa and sat down heavily on it. What? Why? We didn't want this to happen, she said contritely. But Vince and I fell in love. We've been dating for a while now and we don't want to hide our love anymore. Are you having an affair? Colin asked stupidly. She cast a quick glance at her lover. We didn't plan this, but after a while we just couldn't deny our feelings for each other. Anyway, I've already moved a bunch of my stuff into the car. I'll come back for the rest later. But, but, Colin stammered. She ignored his indistinct protest and handed him an envelope that he hadn't noticed before. So, here are the papers and everything else. I've tried to be extremely fair, but just so you know, I've already withdrawn half of our savings. Anyway, you need to hire your own lawyer to review this agreement. If you have any problems with something, he or she can contact my lawyer. I attached her business card to the notification. He silently accepted the envelope, still trying to process what was happening. While he was turning it over in his hands, she returned to Vince and took his hand. He stood up and the two of them headed for the door. But why? What? I've already explained that, she interrupted. She nodded her head at Vince and he opened the front door. She turned around for the last time. So, I think that's it. Colin, I'm really sorry. I want you to know that it wasn't because of you, it was because of me. Then they left taking with them the happiness he had enjoyed for the past eight years. Colin has always considered himself balanced. When an emergency arose at work, he was always able to coolly and quickly analyze the problem before deciding on further actions. Today, that ability has left him. Now his thoughts were chaotic. He was jumping from one to the other, unable to focus on any of them. How could I not understand what was going on? Where can I find a good lawyer? How am I going to prepare for the meeting with Ferguson tomorrow morning? I wonder if Celia had planned anything for dinner. How am I even going to get through this, he thought. These and other thoughts raced through his mind over and over again, spinning and repeating. Each one demanded attention until he put his hands to his head, trying to stop them. In desperation, he struggled to his feet and headed back to the bedroom. Taking off his clothes, he left her lying where she had fallen, then climbed into bed in mental exhaustion. It is noteworthy that he soon fell asleep, and remained in bed until the next morning. When he woke up, the noise in his head had subsided, but evidence of the new reality of his life surrounded him from all sides. He immediately realized that Celia was not with him, and when he went to get dressed, he found that her part of the closet was empty. Going to the kitchen to make coffee, it seemed to him that the footsteps echoed in the empty house. Even when he looked out the window, the North Carolina morning seemed noticeably darker than usual. Vince Callahan woke up to find Celia staring at the ceiling with her hands behind her head. What are you thinking about, honey? He asked. 
I was thinking about Colin, she replied. I hope he's okay. He's going to be fine, Vince said dismissively. I hope so, she said. When we left, he looked like he was in a state of shock. I'm kind of sorry. I mean, he wasn't a bad husband. It just got kind of mundane, you know? Well, that's not going to happen to us, he promised. You will get a lot of impressions. At the same time, he playfully bit her left nipple, then rolled on top of her and began to kiss her passionately. Oh, Vince, yes, she breathed out. The memories of last night's passion returned quickly, and in the sensual bliss, any thoughts about Colin quickly evaporated. For most of the day, the envelope Celia had given him was on Colin's desk in the office. Finally, he couldn't delay any longer, opened it, and began to read the divorce petition and the proposed financial settlement. But it was difficult to focus on the dry legal language because he absolutely did not want a divorce. What he wanted to do was put his head on the table and cry, but he didn't want anyone in the office to see him like this. After a few minutes, he got up and slowly walked down the hall to his boss's office. This woman had hired him a long time ago, and he considered her his mentor. She looked up at him when he knocked on the doorframe, then looked more closely. Are you okay, Colin? You don't look well. Do you know the name of a good divorce lawyer? He asked with a crestfallen expression. Damn it. Colin, not you and Celia, sit down. With these words, the woman stood up and closed the door of her office. Then she sat down on the chair next to Colin and put her hand on his forearm. Tell me what happened, she asked with obvious concern. This time, Colin was no longer hiding his tears. After meeting with a lawyer recommended by his boss, he regretted it. The man's advice was to bluntly accept what Celia offered and leave. But I don't care how good her offer is, Colin protested. First of all, I don't want to get divorced, and I certainly don't want to pay her to leave me and live with some other man. Listen to me. You need to think about it rationally. The lawyer sighed. You can't force your wife to stay married to you if she wants to leave. And frankly, you would hardly want her to stay if all you get is an unhappy wife. As for the payment, you didn't have to look at it from my side of the table. All that Celia, Celia, right? All she's asking is to split up your current assets. She doesn't even ask for alimony. Obviously, she plans to remarry as soon as the divorce takes place. Listen up. I have seen wives preying on their husbands' retirement accounts, demanding exorbitant amounts of alimony, and petitioning for the confiscation of most of the family property, including the house. Your wife is behaving sensibly. Do not anger her and do not provoke her into vindictive actions. Maybe so, Colin said stubbornly but the fact remains that I still don't want a divorce. The lawyer nodded and his tone became sympathetic. Colin, listen, you don't need a family lawyer's advice. Firstly, I'm not good at it, and secondly, I charge a lot more than any marriage counselor. If you are not ready to sign a divorce agreement, my advice is to find someone who will help you deal with your feelings. When Colin told his boss about the meeting, she surprised him by handing him a business card. I had a feeling that this might be your reaction after our conversation. I think you should see Dr. Helmar. He is a psychologist specializing in marital problems. Several of my friends contacted him, and all of them were from him in Ostorg. Try it and see if it can help. At the third counseling session, Colin began to repeat his complaints again, until Dr. Helmar interrupted him. Look, Colin, let's be honest. You're stuck. All I want you to do is, figuratively speaking, change the direction. I'm sure you're familiar with the five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. People make the mistake of thinking that they are different from each other, and you also fall into this category. Listening to you, I have repeatedly heard you describe all the stages except acceptance. It's completely natural for someone who is going through what you've been through. But you also told me that you are a rational person who is able to sort out problems and find a solution. This is what you need to do now. Put aside emotions so that you can develop a strategy that will allow you to move forward. You should start thinking clearly and understand that Celia won't want to come back. Understand that there's no point in coming back if she doesn't want to be with you. Until you can accept the reality of these factors, over which I would add you have no power, you will continue to remain at an impasse. You need to solve the problem of later life after Celia's departure based on the facts, just as you have done when faced with other problems in the past. Colin sat quietly, thinking about what the consultant had just said. He realized that most of the pain he was experiencing stemmed from how crazy and unexpected everything had happened. There was no warning, 
no indication that their marriage was in trouble. One minute he was a happily married man, and the next day he has to get divorced. The day before he was sure that Celia loved him, and the next day he found out that she was sleeping with another man. How can he move forward when he doesn't know what's real? How can he move on when he's full of anger? The consultant calmly listened to Colin's outburst. As soon as Colin stopped talking, Dr. Helmar asked, Have you ever heard of Reinhold Niebuhr? Colin shook his head. He was a widely recognized theologian of the 20th century who composed a simple, effective prayer. God grant me the peace of mind to accept what I cannot change, the courage to change what I can, and the wisdom to distinguish. This is a prayer for serenity. I've heard of it. It's an Alcoholics Anonymous prayer. That's right. In any case, in my opinion, it simply and eloquently describes the passage of the stages of grief. This is what you need to strive for, calmness, acceptance, and wisdom. Until you do this, you will not be able to move on. When Colin left the session that day, Niebuhr's prayer continued to ring in his head. Serenity is what he needs in his life. The question is, how to achieve this? What can he do to find peace? Thinking about it all weekend, he decided on a plan of action. On Monday, Colin called his lawyer. I'll agree to anything Celia asks if I can meet her face, to face for half an hour. Are you sure? The lawyer asked. I have seen such clashes go terribly badly, and very few of them satisfied both sides in the divorce. It's going to be different this time, I promise. Prepare a meeting. When Colin was ushered into the conference room of Celia's lawyer, he was surprised to see Vince sitting next to her and holding her hand. Actually, it's even better, Colin thought. Now Vince and Celia can both hear it from the first mouth. Celia's lawyer motioned for him to begin, and Colin cleared his throat. Look, Celia, this is as hard for me as it is for you. Things didn't work out the way I wanted between us, but I think that's true of a lot of other things. In this case, what's done is done, and now it's time for me to move on. My lawyer said you offered a fair settlement and advised me to accept it. Based on the fact that I need to move on, I will do so. He picked up a pen from the table and signed the agreement with a flourish. When the couple on the other side of the table exchanged looks of relief, he added, There's something else I want to say. The couple froze, fearing what might come next. I understand that you are planning to get married as soon as the divorce is final, Colin continued. So in the spirit of moving on, let me wish you all the happiness you deserve in your marriage. With that, he walked around the table and shook hands with the startled Vince. Then he leaned over and gave Celia a friendly hug and kissed her on the cheek. While the two lovers watched in surprise, he turned and left the room. They looked at each other. What just happened? Vince asked. Celia shook her head in amazement. I didn't expect that. She then smiled. But it's wonderful. The last thing I want is for us to have wars every time we see him. After signing the divorce agreement, Colin had to sell the house they jointly owned. Celia wasn't interested in him because she moved into Vince's house. Colin didn't have the funds necessary to buy out Celia's share. And even if he did, he knew that the house was too big for him. And at the same time, the house held too many memories. The good news was that the real estate market was booming, so it wouldn't be a problem to sell the house. The bad news was that in the two years since the purchase of the house, it had not increased much in price, even in the face of increased demand. But ultimately, Colin had enough money left for the down payment for a two-bedroom condominium in a nice apartment complex. By the time the house was sold, his new apartment was bought and Colin moved in, the waiting period for a divorce was almost over. Colin learned from a friend that Vince and Celia had already sent out wedding invitations. Needless to say, Colin did not receive an invitation, but he learned that the happy couple would go on their honeymoon to the Caribbean. He made his plans accordingly. When the tanned couple returned, Vince scooped Celia up in his arms, preparing to carry her over the threshold. But when he went inside, he noticed a card with the inscription slipped under the door. Check the back terrace. Worried, he set his young wife on her feet, grabbed her hand, and hurried out onto the terrace. At first, he didn't see anything unusual, but when he turned the other way, his eyes widened and he gasped. A luxurious three-burner propane grill glittered there, plugged in and ready to go. He turned back to Celia. Did you buy this for me? I've always wanted the same one, but they're so expensive. No, she admitted. I don't know anything about it. Trying to figure out the origin of this item, she noticed an envelope taped to the shiny stainless steel grill lid. When she came over, she took it off and opened it. 
After reading the postcard inside, she caught her breath. I can't believe it, it's from Colin. It says here, best wishes in connection with the wedding. Did Colin give it to us? Vince asked incredulously. If that's what he meant by moving on, then all I can say is he's a better person than me. This is an amazing gift. I will be happy to roast on it this summer. I have to call and thank him, Celia said as Vince checked the grill's capabilities. When Colin picked up the phone, he heard a mixture of surprise, gratitude, and even a slight sense of guilt in Celia's voice. Colin, we just found your wedding present. I can't believe you bought this expensive grill for us. It's too expensive. Did Vince like him? Liked is not the right word. He's still on the terrace, drooling. Fine, I was hoping he'd like it. But you don't have to do anything like that. We didn't even invite you to the wedding. Colin laughed. What are you? That would be too weird. But I meant what I said. It's time for me to accept what happened and move on. A gift is my way of showing that that's exactly what I'm doing. So I was hoping that you and Vince would like it. When Celia returned to the veranda to tell Vince about it, he shook his head in surprise. Like I said, he's a better person than me. Anyway, how about I make some burgers for dinner tonight, Mrs. Callahan? As April turned into May, Celia and Vince began making plans to celebrate Mother's Day with Celia's mom. They decided to invite her to a nice restaurant, but when they suggested the idea to her, Celia's mother objected. On Mother's Day, there is a madhouse everywhere. I would be happy if we celebrated here. So plans were made according to which the newlyweds had to bring a special dish with salmon and grilled vegetables on Vince's new favorite toy. On the way, Celia asked her husband, Did you remember to buy flowers for mom? Hitting his head with his hand, Vince quickly turned off the highway and pulled into the parking lot of a regional grocery store chain. He soon returned with a dozen pink roses. They're a little wilted, he apologized to Celia. But the main thing is the attitude. When Vince arrived and brought the dishes to the kitchen, he handed the roses to Celia's mother with wishes for a happy Mother's Day. Thanks, Vince, she told him. I'll put them in the vase later. Then she invited them to serve themselves and take the plates to the dining room. Your dad is starving, she whispered to her daughter. When the food arrived, Celia couldn't help but notice the gorgeous bouquet of flowers that was in the middle of the dining table. Mom, they're great, she said. Did your dad give you this? Her mother giggled. Dad? He told me that I was not his mother. Actually, Colin sent them to me. Aren't they beautiful? Colin. Exactly. That's very nice of him, her mother said. Nodding, Celia noticed a frown flicker across her new husband's face. Later that day, when the couple were at home, Celia left for a few minutes and called Colin. Why did you send this bouquet to my mother? What is it? She asked. Ah, so it was delivered on time. Did she like the flowers? Of course, she was delighted, Celia admitted. They were beautiful, but why did you send them? Colin sighed. Your mother has always been very nice to me. And since my mother died many years ago, I have always felt a special closeness with her. That's why I wanted to express my respect. I hope it didn't become a problem. No, no, not at all. As I said, she was really very grateful. I just didn't expect it, that's all. To be honest, I really appreciate it too. Well, if I didn't make a mistake, I want to ask a favor. Hmm, of course. And what is it? It's a little awkward to talk about this, but I think it's time for me to get back to dating. He could almost hear her hesitation. Colin, I'm going to be very embarrassed if you're trying to set me up on a date. No way, nothing like that. I just imagine inviting a companion to my apartment, and frankly, she looks like a mess right now, and looks more like a haven. Can I hire you for repairs? You've always had much better taste than me. That's what I didn't expect. But of course I think I can do it. I just finished a big design project, so I'm free, and I can start right now. Can I come back next week and take a look at everything? Of course. Now I work from home three days a week, so Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday will suit me. Great. I'll come on Tuesday afternoon. When Colin let her into his apartment the following Tuesday, Celia immediately understood what he was talking about. All the walls were painted dirty white, the carpet was worn and faded, and the furniture consisted mostly of what he had inherited from their former home. I see that we could choose a variety of options here, she told him after inspecting the place. Therefore, maybe you will first decide which style you would prefer. He shrugged helplessly. To be honest, Celia, I don't really know much about styles, color theory, or anything like that. He looked around uncertainly, then beamed. 
What I would really like is for you to design a place that you would like yourself. He waved his hands. I don't mean something feminine and pink. I definitely want it to look like a man lives here. But I also don't want it to look like a sports bar. He pointed in her direction. Just a place that someone like you would like. A place where a woman with good taste would feel comfortable. You're the only one I can trust with this. That's really flattering, Colin. In fact, I think I know exactly what you want. Let me go back to my studio and design the sketches. Then, having prepared a few options, I'll call you back and we'll see what you choose. Perfect. Thank you, Celia. I really appreciate it. For the next two months, Celia saw Colin almost once a week. They had to choose a design plan, review and finalize the proposed decor, and then control the repairs they had agreed on. After that, she constantly brought him samples of fabrics, paints, and photographs of furniture for approval. Colin was pleased with the progress made, but not Vince. Do you have to see him so often? He complained to his wife one evening when she returned from another visit to Colin's apartment. Come on, honey. I don't see Colin any more than I do any of my other clients. And besides, I thought you were comfortable with him, especially after his wedding gift to us. I think he really left everything in the past, she reassured him. Maybe, but you two have a common past and I can't help but wonder if he's really forgotten you. But I forgot about him. And really, if you come into the bedroom with me, I'll show you how completely I've forgotten about him. Although Celia felt that she had managed to temper Vince's jealousy, she was afraid that Colin's next request might inflame her husband again. During one of her visits, he asked her out of the blue, Are you still a member of the book club? Well, yes. We meet every other Saturday afternoon. And what? Is the club only for women or can men join? I don't know. I don't think we've ever been approached by a man asking us to join. Why, are you interested? Actually, yes. I told you that I want to start dating again, but I really don't know what to talk about with a woman. Most of the girls I know aren't particularly interested in sports, so we probably don't have anything in common. I suppose if I knew more about the books that my future sweetheart might be reading, it would at least give me the opportunity to start a conversation. Okay, I get it, she nodded. Actually, on the one hand, it's quite prudent. How about this? At the next meeting of our book club, I will ask a question about your participation. If they don't mind, I'll let you know and you can come to the next meeting. If not, I can at least let you know which book we have chosen so that you can read it yourself. I really appreciate it, Celia. Of course, I would prefer to participate in the discussion and hear what you ladies think about the book. But if they are uncomfortable with a male presence, I will familiarize myself with the book on my own. When Celia brought up the subject with her book club friends, she was pleasantly surprised to find that they were enthusiastic about Colin joining their group. If you're not uncomfortable with your ex, husband's presence, we'd like to familiarize ourselves with the male gaze, they told her. Celia was amused that the two unmarried ladies seemed to be very enthusiastic about Colin's offer to join them. At the first meeting, Colin completely conquered even those participants who expressed doubts. Unlike several ladies, Colin actually finished the book and was able to share some insightful insights. At the same time, he tried not to dominate the discussion. Celia was relieved to see that Colin respected different opinions and repeatedly supported others in their conclusions. At the end of the discussion, everyone agreed that the experiment was a great success, and everyone hugged Colin before leaving. The single participants, Celia noted again, were especially energetic in their expressions of appreciation. Colin not only attended the next meeting, but also invited the group to hold their meeting in his newly renovated condominium. Upon arrival, the ladies spent the first half hour ooing and aahing about the decor, and Colin tirelessly emphasized that it was all Celia's doing. According to custom, the host of the meeting provided snacks and drinks to the participants of the meeting. Colin did his best, providing his guests with several trays of snacks, as well as several bottles of Prosecco, to keep the conversation in the right tone. The discussion of the book that followed may not have been particularly intellectual, but it was definitely lively. When it was time to leave, everyone was profuse in their thanks. One of the unmarried ladies, a pretty young red-haired girl named Kelly, was so insistent in expressing her gratitude that Celia had to take Colin away from her for an imaginary reason. When everyone else left, Celia stayed, offering to help Colin with the cleaning. He gratefully agreed. After the used plates and glasses were sent to the dishwasher, he walked her to the exit. Taking her hands in his, he thanked her for her help and for supporting him to join the group. 
Actually, I should be thanking you. She shook her head. Everyone had a great time, as you might have noticed, and I think you added a lot to our discussion. And thank you for all your compliments about the decor. That was really nice of you. You're welcome, he replied. And thank you for getting rid of Kelly, he added slyly. She tensed instantly. You need to watch out for her, Colin. She's a sweet girl, but she's a little young for you. And from what I've heard, she's a bit of an ogre, if you know what I mean. He nodded emphatically, hiding some surprise at her reaction. I have to go home, and thank you again for everything. Celia smiled and bent down to hug him and kiss him on the cheek. Then she pulled back and looked at him intently. I feel like I'm seeing you from a completely different angle, Colin, and I like it. She kissed him on the cheek once more, then turned and left. When Vince found out about Celia's new book club member, he was visibly upset and demanded that she tell Colin not to come anymore. She, in turn, was clearly annoyed. I won't do anything like that, she retorted. The girls love him and he looks like a great addition to our group. So just stop pretending to be jealous, Vince. Nothing bad is happening and you look stupid pretending that it is. Vince managed to keep his feelings to himself, but that night he felt a strong desire to return his wife to his property. Their lovemaking was unusually energetic. Vince seemed determined to assert his dominance, skimping on foreplay and penetrating her before she was fully aroused. Celia realized what was happening and decided it was wiser not to protest. After that, she kissed him and thanked him, but when he fell asleep, she slipped out of bed and took an Advil pill. The next morning, Vince apologized shyly for the way he had treated her the day before, but she brushed him off. I don't want it to be like this every time, she told him, but sometimes it's nice to have a change of scenery. Feeling relieved, he went to work with a light step. As soon as he left, her forced smile quickly disappeared. As she put on her sundress, Celia discovered that she was still in pain from last night and took another pill. After having breakfast and accepting it, she went to her design studio to see what was planned for the next week. There, she discovered that a rug had been delivered for Colin's apartment and immediately called him, offering to bring it. Encouraged by his agreement, after checking her makeup, she headed towards him. When she entered, she spread out a small carpet in the place where it was intended. Colin praised her choice and then invited her to stay for a minute and have a cup of coffee with him. She readily agreed. However, when she plopped down on his new sofa, she made a face, and Colin immediately noticed it. What's the matter with you, Celia? What is it? He asked with a note of concern in his voice. It's okay, she replied. Vince was a little hmm. He was aggressive with me last night, and I'm in a bit of pain, that's all. She couldn't help but notice the frown that appeared on his face, which was then replaced by an expression of determination. Without saying a word, he pushed the coffee table away from the sofa. Then he grabbed his new rug and spread it out in front of her. Placing a pillow in the middle, he motioned for her to lie down on the rug. She protested weakly but gave in when he insisted. As soon as she lay face down on the carpet, lifting her hips with a pillow, he straddled her and began massaging her neck, starting at the base of her skull. As his fingers stroked and pressed, the tension began to leave her body, and she let out a satisfied moan. Then his hands moved to her shoulders and then along her spine, affecting her broadest muscles. Soon Celia was purring like a contented cat as he flexed her aching back muscles. She was almost ready to fall asleep when she felt him move lower, slide his hands under her pelvic bones and lift them slightly. The effect was impressive. The pain she felt there disappeared. After working with her hips for a few minutes, he released them and brought his hands to her firm buttocks. She inhaled quickly as his hands squeezed and massaged her. But before she could protest, he moved lower again. Now he was massaging the back of her thighs and gently pressing his thumbs against her calves. After a few minutes of this procedure, he moved to her feet, lifted them to take off her shoes and work with the soles and toes. Oh my God, Colin, this is divine. I'm turning into putty. He didn't answer. Instead, he lowered her legs and began to slowly move up her calves, first pressing on the Achilles tendons, then lightly running his fingertips over the skin. He smiled to himself as he noticed that her breathing had quickened. Suddenly he stopped, but before she could protest, she felt his weight on her back, pressing her body into the carpet. This time she was turned on by helplessness. She liked the idea that he could do whatever he wanted with her. She longed for him to take her, and so he did. Their quiet breathing was interrupted by Celia's ringtone. She ignored him at first, but then reluctantly pulled her phone out of her bag. When she saw who was calling, she straightened up and answered the phone. 
Hi, Vince. How are you? Sorry I missed your call. I was busy. No, I'm free now. Of course, lunch sounds tempting. Where can I meet you? Okay, I'll be there in half an hour. I love you. She turned and looked guiltily at Colin. I'm sorry, I have to go. She hurried to the guest bathroom and cleaned herself up as best she could. When she returned, she headed for the door. But before she left, she turned to him. We need to talk. I'll call you. Colin nodded understandingly, and she disappeared. At lunch, Vince asked her again about where she had been and what she had been doing, and Celia just clarified her previous excuses a little. Eventually, he changed the subject. He thought he noticed something different about her, but he couldn't figure out what exactly had changed. That night, he wanted to sleep with her again, ignoring her statement that she was too tired. She managed to take a shower at home after they returned, but she was still afraid that he might find some evidence of her infidelity. However, Colin was so gentle in his lovemaking that Vince did not detect the slightest hint of her cheating. However, she felt relieved when he finished and fell asleep. As for Celia, she lay for a long time thinking about her morning with Colin. The next day, Colin was working on a computer in his home office when his cell phone rang. Glancing at the display, he wasn't surprised to see that Celia was calling. She begged for a meeting so they could talk, and he invited her to come right away. After disconnecting, he quickly finished the report he was working on, then prepared a text message on another phone. When he heard the front door ring and made sure it was Celia, he pressed send on his phone. When he opened the front door and let Celia in, he saw a worried expression on her face. She went inside, he closed the door behind her, then turned and looked at her intently. Colin, we need to talk about what happened yesterday, she began, but he pressed his fingers to her lips, stopping her. She stared at him in confusion until he came closer and replaced his fingers with his lips. Oh my God, she breathed out before passionately returning his kiss. While their tongues searched for each other, he led her backwards into his bedroom, unbuttoning her clothes on the way. By this time, she was already out of breath and quickly began to pull off his knitted shirt, pulling it over his head and throwing it on the floor before hurriedly reaching for his belt. They undressed each other in a flash, then Colin scooped Celia up in his arms and laid her on his bed. Celia howled at his onslaught, then screamed in surprise as he grabbed her and rolled over, pulling her to him. But she quickly seized the initiative, tucking her knees under her, and began to ride him as fast and hard as she could. This time, instead of moaning, she screamed a string of obscenities. Colin, oh my God. Vince was working at his desk when an anonymous text message arrived on his personal mobile. If you want to find Celia, you should check Colin's bedroom, it read. Who is this? He typed, but got no answer. Normally, he would have ignored the message from an unknown phone, but this message reinforced the paranoia he had been experiencing for some time. Grabbing the car keys, he rushed into the office garage and raced to Colin's house. Vince roared into the parking lot of Colin's condo. When he spotted Celia's car, he braked sharply in front of the main entrance, not even bothering to look for a parking spot. Jumping out of the car, he saw a man coming out of the entrance and rushed through the open door before it could close. Rushing inside, he stopped at the entrance to get his bearings. Then he went up the stairs to the second floor, not wanting to risk Colin and Celia hearing the elevator. When he reached the stairwell, he hurried straight to the entrance to Colin's apartment. His first thought was to slam his shoulder into the door and rush inside. But when he reached for the door handle, it readily turned in his hand. That dumb bastard forgot to lock the door. He rejoiced. Slipping into the apartment, he stealthily headed for the master bedroom. There was no doubt about where to go or what he would find there. What the fuck, Celia? Vince roared. How could you do this to me, especially this one? Shocked, she turned her head sharply to see the one person she would most like to avoid. Vince stood there in obvious pain and anger, his fists clenched, tears streaming down his cheeks. No, Vince, no, you have to let me explain. She started, but Vince wouldn't listen to that. There's nothing to explain, you cheating fool. You broke my heart. I never want to see you again. With that, he turned and staggered blindly out of the bedroom, heading for the front door. Wait, Vince, stop it. You can't be serious. Just wait a second, Celia shouted, desperately pulling on her clothes to follow her husband. Colin watched Celia leave in silence. Then he got dressed and returned to his office. Noticing the disposable phone he had left on the table, he picked it up and threw it in the trash. I don't think I'll need it anymore, he told himself. When the phone fell to the bottom of the bucket, the message he sent was displayed on the screen. 
if you want to find Celia, you should look in Colin's bedroom. He was still working when he was interrupted by a timid knock on the front door. When he opened it, Celia came in, dragging a large suitcase on wheels behind her. She turned to face him, and Colin saw that her eyes were red and her makeup was running down her cheeks. Vince kicked me out, she said with tears in her eyes. How is he? Colin asked. He's a wreck, she replied. One minute he was yelling at me, and the next minute he was sobbing. I could hardly understand what he was saying. The only thing that was clear was that my appearance was killing him and that he wanted me to get out as soon as possible. She shook her head. I'm really worried about him, but I don't know what I can do. I know that feeling. Colin nodded. Then her gloomy expression cleared up. But at least for now, you and I can be together. We don't have to hide how we feel about each other. She raised her arms to hug him, but was stopped by his reaction. I don't think so. She was confused not only by his words, but even more by his tone. What are you saying? What is it? She asked. Actually, you're right, Celia. We don't have to hide our feelings anymore. And my feelings are such that I wouldn't take you back even if you were the last woman in the world. I would be crazy if I brought back a traitor. No, twice a traitor into my life. She was shocked by his outburst, but quickly tried to regain the advantage. I may have cheated on Vince, but I did it to make up for the mistake I made by leaving you. Now I'm back and I'm going to spend the rest of my life showing you how loving and faithful I can be. You really are quite the thing. Colin chuckled. You treat men as interchangeable parts. When you get tired of one, you change it for another. If the second option doesn't work, no problem. Just go back to the first one. That's not fair, Colin. Besides, you wanted me, you seduced me. He nodded his head in sarcastic agreement. Well, of course I understand. All you need is for some guy to be polite to you, give you a couple of compliments, maybe give you a gift, and you'll drop your panties in the blink of an eye. No, it's not like that. That's exactly what it is, and I have no doubt that if I took you back, the same thing would happen again. Well, I have news for you, Celia. I've seen what you really are. As the song says, we will never be together again. He went to the front door, yanked it open, and threw her bag out into the hallway. Get out! Stop it! He shouted. Tears streamed down her face and her breath caught between sobs. Oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. Where should I go? He crossed his arms over his chest. If you want my opinion, I would recommend going straight to hell. Cowering in the face of his anger, she staggered back to the door, and Colin quickly slammed it shut, this time making sure that he had bolted it. Then he walked over to his couch and plopped down on it, feeling the adrenaline slowly leave his body. As he began to relax, he began to think about everything that had happened. I wonder what Dr. Helmar would say about all this. In the end, I followed at least some of his instructions. I gained the wisdom to understand what I could change, and the courage to make changes, even if sometimes I had to hold my nose. But I'll leave the acceptance to Vince and Celia. He shook his head. I don't think it will be easy for any of them to achieve calmness. Vince will have to come to terms with the fact that he is a cuckold who is about to be divorced. Celia will have to come to terms with the fact that she is a cheating fool who was kicked out of the house and who will be forced to divorce a second time. He smiled grimly. Maybe I should send them Dr. Helmar's business card. Satisfied, he looked around, admiring his renovated apartment. Then he returned to his office and sat down at his desk. While doing so, he noticed a business card with Kelly's name and number, which he had saved. It was handwritten on the back. Call me sometime. He nodded to himself. I think I'm ready to do just that.